Okay. I'm going to say good morning here now. It's not for everybody. Good afternoon, Candice. Thank you very much for coming today. Really, very much appreciate it. Um, those of you who came uh, to our last presentation in November, uh, thank you for coming and you know, not being turned off and coming to the second one. Those who didn't, I just want to mention that we um, put our recording of that presentation on the website. It's taken us a little while to get the technology sorted. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in what uh, we talked about last November, uh, then try our website. Just search uh, Camus Valley History into Google, and you should find us quite quickly. Uh, and it's on there at the top of the book. Uh, it has a full presentation uh, of um, Joe's uh, presentation of his grandfather, Joe Frazier, who was interned in a prison war camp, a famous one called Stalag Luft III. Uh, in the Second World War. Uh, so he was part of the Great Escape. Those of you who have seen the TV uh, film, uh, including Steve McQueen, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, I uh, recommend watching the presentation because clips from the film were in there. If it doesn't inspire you to watch the film, I'd be surprised. <laughs> uh, for those who don't know who we are, well, I'm Paul Wynn, and I'm a member of the Canvas Valley History Group. We've been going for about 18 months, part of the Canvas 2020 setup. And uh, our objective is to try and help preserve the history of Camus Valley. And we're running out of time. A lot of the history is in people's heads. And unless that is recorded and, and, and preserved, then we know it will go with them and pass with them. So we've got a, a very tight schedule. We really have to get working. And we've been doing our best to try and get that uh, uh, moving forward the last uh, 18 months. You may have seen us at uh, the local Camus events uh, yesterday, so Quigronia, etc., with our mobile museum. Come and join us, Billy. There's a couple of chairs down here. Um, and uh, we plan to be at uh, all of the events again this year. So please come along and see us. Each presentation will be different. The museum will, will contain different things uh, each time, uh, usually orientated towards that particular area. So hopefully we'll have Oakley, Camus will have uh, bits and pieces about something in Camus, maybe buildings, etc. Uh, we also uh, have a calendar which we uh, produce every year. Hopefully, you had a chance to see that. There's a couple left over. Uh, it's only April, so we're half price, and you're getting three quarters of a year for half price. That's <laughs> yeah, we're a non profit, so um, yeah, we are going to have to raise some funds if we want to do some of the work that we intend to do. See us uh, try to embark on uh, fundraising and please help and support us. If you can, just get the word out. Yeah, word of mouth is very powerful. I know these things, Facebook, etc., they're also very powerful, but personally, I prefer word of mouth. Hopefully, you know, you'll have good things to say about it. So that's, what, that's our attempt, that's our objective. You know, we, we're here today really to try and celebrate the history of Camus Valley, and that's the full 360 degrees. Not just the good bits, but some of the bad bits. Our grandfathers and great grandmothers, etc., lived through much tougher times than we did, and that we are now. So, if we have sympathy for ourselves, maybe looking at history reminds us that we don't deserve that much sympathy because some of those went through much more severe hardships. And it's with that context that we want to look at a couple of people's lives from the deep past. 100 years or so ago, from that perspective, we cannot put ourselves in the shoes of the people that lived then. We shouldn't try it. But what we should try to do is to learn the lessons of their lives, of their histories, and their experiences, and the outcomes, not of all of which are good outcomes. When we did Joe Frazier's grandfather, Leo, that was good and bad. I can't think of much worse than a war. But Leo came through it, survived, his children prospered, and he had a good life. And I think it was worth celebrating his. But it was good and bad. And I think you'll see good and bad in the lives of the people that we're going to talk about today. Please remember that. We do not want to put ourselves in judgment or try to put ourselves in those shoes. But it's from that context we want to learn some life, some lessons. People like humour, uh, it's a way of um, making us all smile and bringing us together a little bit. So uh, Deb and uh, Sean have put together a presentation which has a, a fun title. 
And to, to be honest, some of these people are rascals, rogues, reprobates, and some of them aren't. You make your own judgment, but remember you are judging out of context. We do not know the hardships these people are facing. So if you don't mind, I'd like to hand over to our chair of the Camus Valley History Group and his son, Deborah Lambert and Sean, who are going to present those lives to you today. Thank you. Like so. There you go. Testing. There you go. All right. There you go. So, he's taller than me. <laughs> Trying to be authentic here by having my son here, a fifth generation campsite. So, um, right. it, adds a, it adds a little bit of authenticity. And as far as I know, none of the Lamberts are in here, but they probably should be. Um, so, Camas Valley has a rich history of hardworking, upstanding people who in, in future presentations we will highlight. The three men we will focus on today were not necessarily bad men, but when uncontrolled tempers mixed with alcohol and guns, bad things happen. <laughs> you will probably recognize some of the names. We have tried to portray the actual photos of people. See, I've already forgotten. It's always good to start with technology problems right from the get-go. Are we on? Whoops. All right. Let's try this again. Uh, you will probably recognize the names. We have tried to portray the actual photos of people or places involved. But if none could be found, we used images that resemble what we're talking about. In other words, you may need to use your imagination. The Camas Valley History Group believes the purpose of our group is to capture and share history as accurately as possible. As you will see, we tried to stick to what the newspapers of the Times reported, realizing that newspapers are not always accurate. If we get the facts wrong, we ask you to correct us with reliable evidence, or if you have any additional insight into the lives of these men, please share them, but please wait until the end of the presentation. As you listen, if you have questions, we will do our best to answer them. But please wait until the end of each man's history story to ask. The first rascal we spotlight is William James Pace. He had a very colorful life and death. James was born in Provo, Utah in 1854. He came from a prominent family in Utah history and American history. He was the third child of 15, born to William Brian Pace and Epsi Jane Williams of Provo. His father was born in Tennessee and was a colonel and leader in the Mormon Battalion. His great-grandfather, James Pace, fought alongside Andrew Jackson in the War of 1812. He was killed in the famous Battle of New Orleans. The Pace family arrived in what would become America in 1611, nine years before the Pilgrims settled in Jamestown, Virginia. When James was 19, he married Victoria Hogart. As a young girl of 16, she was encouraged to get married because of the uh, crowd conditions at home, crowded conditions at home. William and Victoria were married in October 1873 and had two sons. It says in her history. Oh, Bill Pace proved to be a non-educated lazy boy whose only ambition was to have Vic read novels to him. <laughs> Oof. Sounds good to me. <laughs> uh -huh. At age 19, with the advice of her church leaders, Victoria Adelaide divorced Bill Pace in 1876, taking her two sons home with her. Born in 1859 in Florence, Nebraska, Mary Elizabeth Giant settled in Camas with her family in 1864. Her parents were George and Ann Giant. On November 25th, 1880, she married William James Pace. The couple lived in Camas until 1884 when they moved to Woodland. Elizabeth was the mother of 15 children. 11 lived to adulthood. As mentioned, William Pace 
was a colorful character. He, appe he appeared in the newspapers on a regular basis. In Bill's lifetime, newspapers were basically the only form of getting the news. In an attempt to keep things accurate as possible, we will quote directly from the news articles. Be, be aware that those reporting news in those days provided a good dose of personal opinion in their reporting. The following are just a sample of news articles we found about Mr. Pace. An account from 1890 shows William Pace getting involved in local politics. A man that would show up a few, in a few of Mr. Pace's articles was his neighbor, Thomas Pullen Potts of Woodland. The article says, four ballots were taken before a nomination was declared. Mr. Potts of Woodland receiving a majority, he was declared the nominee for selectman. After the county ten convention adjourned yesterday, W.J. Pace of Woodland swore out a warrant against Mr. Potts of Woodland, accusing him of being a Mormon and in sympathy with the People's Party. No action was taken in regard to it yet, but should this be proven on Mr. Potts, it is thought he will stand a poor show of being elected. So for a little bit of Utah history, the People's Party until 1890s, the main political parties in Utah were the Liberal Party, primarily non-Mormons or Gentiles, and the People's Party, primarily Mormons. Both parties were involved in contentious elections, but until the passage of the Edmund Tucker Act, the People's Party easily won the elections, and that's why he accused him of being a Mormon, which is ironically, he was a Mormon himself. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> His litigations continue. In 1890, he sued South Camas Irrigation Company. In the 1890s, he opened a sawmill in Camas Valley. In April of 1893, the loggers who provided lumber for the mill sued him for low wages, 25 cents for every dollar they earned. Pace lost the suit. Four days later, he, was, he lost in court to his loggers. This was reported in the Wasatch Wave. Mr. Pace of Woodland came home from Park City a few days ago and being loaded with tingle leg, meaning intoxicated, told his wife and family to get in the wagon and skip that he didn't want to see them any around anymore. He then proceeded to get a rope and informed Andy Madison, who was standing by, that he had had enough of this world and was going to hang himself. He proceeded with a few preliminaries, but when Mr. Madison told him to go in, he thought the better of it and came to the conclusion that maybe Andy wouldn't cut him down in time to save his life and that he had better try life a few days longer in the snow-clad valley of the Wasatch Range. <laughs> Edwin Kimball was a wealthy mine supplies businessman in Park City. He was also the mayor of Park City. When he died, William Pace owed him nearly $7,000. Edwin's wife, Geneva, sued him for the money. There are no details in the case of the Park City Bank suing him that same year. In 1896, Bill Pace sued his neighbor, Parley Neely, for $40.90 for goods and merchandise sold and delivered. Neely demanded a jury trial, and Pace demanded Neely be required to provide the sum to defray the costs of a jury. The Justice Van Tassel denied the request, and his own motion made an order requiring Pace to pay the cost of the jury. Bill Pace refused to comply with the order, whereupon the Justice refused to proceed with the case and subsequently dismissed it. Pace then turned around and sued Justice J.D. Van Tassel. <laughs> the case was overruled. It appears the Bill Pace decided to get out of the sawmill business and start a new one. In 1897, the local newspaper announced the opening of the Pace Creamery in Woodland. Its present capacity is 350 pounds of butter a day. It mentions this in the second creamery, creamery plants in Summit County. The other, the Crystal Creamery in Camas, has a capacity of 500 pounds of butter per day. Cheese is also manufactured in this factory. Within months of opening his creamery, William Pace sued the Crystal Creamery for damages. <laughs> the article says, William J. Pace filed suit against the Crystal Creamery Company of Camas, claiming damages in the sum of $9,000 and costs of court. The charge is in six different causes of action, alleging defamation of character, slander, and libel, as verbally stated to sundry persons by the managers 
of defendant company, and also by published notices in a newspaper of general circulation in the county. Four years later, the case was dismissed. <laughs> Apparently, William Pace lost interest in the creamery and spent the next nine years looking for gold and silver in nearby areas. He was more than willing to share his exploration with local newspapers. From the paper, Mr. Pace, who drove in yesterday, says that during the past week, claims have been located in all directions, and people have been hurrying to the county recorder for the purpose of filing their location notices. But what caused the excitement? Mr. Pace says there's a great deal of prospecting going on in the hills back of Woodland and Camas this season. He believes that something good will be found before the season closes. Notice Pace talks a lot about claims and prospecting but not actually finding any gold or silver. <laughs> Three years later, without any mention of finding precious metals, this is the report. W.J. Pace came over from Woodland yesterday with a quantity of promising looking quartz, which he left for a say. Mr. Pace says he has a big thing if the rock carries any value of consequence. Three years later, Pace tells the newspaper he is going to the head of the Provo River, which he claims promising prospects are located. Still no report on actual silver. Again, Thomas Potts is part of William Pace's story. He buys Potts house and tells the paper he is now heavily interested in mining ground over on the reservation and will put most of his time in that locality during the summer. Nothing was reported about finding any precious metals on the reservation involving Pace. It seemed William Pace loved publicity. In the summer of 1908, he became the headline news in many papers in Utah. From the newspaper, yesterday, all the members of his family who live at Woodland, some three miles from this place, Camas, except the father, came to Camas to celebrate the 24th. After the ball game in the evening, the family drove home and sent one of the boys on ahead to drive up the cows. As the boy came up to the corral, his father came out of the house in a very ugly mood, being mad with drink, and ordered the boy to drive the cows back again. Just then, the rest of the family drove up, and the mother told the boy to put the cows up so that they could be milked. The father then turned upon the family and roundly abused them and ordered them to leave the place. The team was hitched up again and the wife and children began loading in some of their things, among them being a rifle belonging to the oldest son, Will. The father continued his abuse, struck and choked his wife when one of the boys got an ax to defend his mother. The old man then went to the house and got a revolver, threatening to kill the whole family. He chased after his son, Will, and the pistol leveled upon him. The young man reached into the wagon and got his rifle and commanded his father to keep off. The old man came at his son with the pistol pointed at the ladder when the boy in self-defense shot. His father threw the heart, killing him instantly. From the newspaper, as soon as he realized what he had done, the young man hunted up the constable of the precinct, James A. Knight, who was holding him pending a preliminary hearing. The sympathy of the people is with the young man, as they feel he was fully justified, as it was apparently the only thing he could do, as the old man was always wild and dangerous when under the influence of liquor. The son is 26 years old and has an excellent standing in the community. The father was 54 years old and had the reputation of being a dangerous man and under the influence of liquor. Only a couple of days later, this was reported. The coroner's jury, after hearing the evidence of all the members of the family who saw the shooting, brought in a verdict of justifiable homicide. Young Pace was at once released. William R. Pace, Bill's son, was completely exonerated this afternoon by the coroner's jury for the killing of his father, William J. Pace. When the verdict came in, it was impossible to keep order in the courtroom, the spectators indulging in a general jollification at the results. <laughs> Don't know that word. <laughs> Great word. Once again from the newspaper, 
The funeral occurred Monday afternoon at Woodland and was one of the largest ever held in the county. The remarks were made by Bishop Rasband and Thomas Potts, old friend of the family. The LDS choir furnished the music, rendering some beautiful selections. Ironically, Mr. Thomas Potts was the same person Pace sued for being a Mormon 18 years earlier. As far as I can find, this was the last time William J. Pace was in the news. Any questions, comments, or corrections about William J. Pace? Brother Pace, do you have any? <laughs> oh, seems right. <laughs> Make sure he doesn't follow me out to the car afterward. <laughs> we'll sue you for slander. <laughs> yeah, we'll sue you. Anyone? Okay. Okay. We'll move on. Jedediah Woodard was raised in Canis Valley and lived an exemplary life. He raised his children in the valley. About 1910, he moved to Salt Lake City. A few years after moving to the city, he did a very bad thing. Jedediah was born in Salt Lake to Margaret and Charles North Woodard in 1863. His father was born in Massachusetts and his mother in Pennsylvania. The family were some of the first settlers of Camas Valley, coming here around 1867. His Woodard ancestors were very early colonists of America, coming to the country around 1634. Jedediah was the fourth of not was the fourth child out of nine. This photo taken in 1905 appears to be his parents and some of his siblings. Jediah married Evelyn Bullitt Look, Russell on 9th February 1880. Evelyn Bullitt was born 6 September 1863 in Camas, one of the first children born in this valley that was settled only two years before. Her parents were Charles Lyman and Samantha Jane Buckland Russell. She was 16 years old when they married. Jed was 17. Jedediah and Evelyn Bilet had 12 children, three girls and nine boys. Four of them did not live to adulthood. Miraculously, their first baby was born only five days after they were married. Sadly, <laughs> it was still there. <laughs> not all funny. <laughs> gotta, gotta get something in there. <laughs> When Jedediah was 38 years old, with eight children living at home, he was called on the Latter-day Saint mission to the southern states from 1901 to 1903. As soon as he came home, he was prepared for leadership positions in the church. He was a high priest and second counselor to Frederick Rasband of Park City Ward, the same Frederick Rasband that officiated at Bill Pace's funeral a couple of years later. In 1906, he was elected county commissioner for Summit County and served two years from 1907 to 1909. This may help you understand what is about to come. This was a written account by one of Jed Jedediah's descendants. My grandfather said when my grandma and him had their first son, they wanted to name him Jed. My grandfather's mother told him absolutely not. He said his great grandfather, Jedediah Woodard, had a tremendous temper and continued to tell him a story of Jedediah milking cows one day when the cow wouldn't do what he wanted him to do. He took an ax to the cow's legs. Temper, temper. Yee. <laughs> On May 2nd, 1917, Jedediah Woodard, who was living at 865 West Williamson Avenue in Salt Lake City, got into an argument with his son Charles Alfred over their shared business. Al was 25 years old, married with a two-year-old son. There is more than one story explaining what happened, but the end result was that Alfred Woodard, 25 years old, died at Holy Cross Hospital. At 8.55 last night, the, two, the 22 caliber bullet fired by his father, Jim Dye Woodard, yesterday afternoon proved to have penetrated the brain. In this case, you will hear from several witnesses of, of this incident. You will hear highlights from the trial. You can play detective, judge, and jury weigh the evidence and decide if you would find a defendant guilty or not. So pay attention closely to what goes on at the trial. It's like a real true crime podcast. True crime. <laughs> All right. From the newspaper. The tragedy has aroused universal sympathy at police headquarters for Officer J.E. Woodard, brother of Jedediah Woodard. 
He is known as a most efficient officer and a man of unfailing kindness and courtesy. His position in having to perform the duty of arresting his own brother on such a charge is one that might be paralleled in fiction, but seldom in real life. And the officials who have to prosecute the charge against the brother of their friend and fellow worker are in a position almost as painful. A few years after the slaying, James rose to the head of the Salt Lake City Police Department Automotive Bureau. Just think about that. It was a whole new thing back then. <laughs> uh, when questioned on the day of the tragedy, Woodard's story is that his son and himself had quarreled over a settlement of their affairs following into dissolution of partnership in the teaming business. The partnership, the father said, proved unprofitable. The son asserted that the father owed him some money. This the father denied. The son said that he would take one of the teams in payment of the alleged debt. And when the father interfered to prevent the taking of the team, the son struck him, according to the father's story. Then he said he went into the house, secured the rifle, and fired a shot, intending to shoot close to his son's head and frighten him. Mrs. May Taylor and Jedediah Woodard's wife were the chief witnesses of the tragedy. It is understood that their accounts do not corroborate Woodard's story in some details. And that one or two other witnesses who have not yet been questioned at headquarters likely likewise contradict the story in some particulars. The witnesses claimed that Jed clubbed his son with the butt of the rifle and the latter had fallen to the ground. The wife of the dead man was in Eureka visiting with her mother. She wrote to her husband Wednesday morning asking that he send her $50. It is supposed that this led to the son's demand for money and thus indirectly to the tragedy. As Jed spent his first night in jail, he thinks his son is still alive and may survive. The jailer, Horace Heath, didn't have the heart to tell him the boy had died. Woodard, broken heart, Woodard was brokenhearted and repentant. He muttered repeatedly, my son struck me several times and I thought if I fired the rifle in the air, he would be scared. Again from the newspaper, the Slayer declared that he regretted the affair, but that he could not help his act. The son, he said, had attacked him and forced him to use the weapon in self-defense. He denied the story told by witnesses of the affray that he clubbed his son with the butt of the rifle after the latter had fallen to the ground. A post-mortem examination showed that the top of the skull was blackened as if bruised, but Dr. David Andrews said that it was impossible to say whether the blackening resulted from blows or from congestion of blood around the wound. Detective Joseph C. Sharp, accompanied by Woodard's Bishop E. S. Woodard, Woodruff, today is questioning all witnesses in an effort to determine exactly the circumstances of the shooting. It is thought that it may prove that there were mitigating circumstances which would warrant the filing of a charge of murder in the second instead of the first degree. These are some tidbits from the May 3rd newspaper reporters have gathered to paint a clearer picture of the crime. A distraught mother said, yesterday in a mother's sacrificing way, she said that she had property at Camus, which she would willingly give if it would be the means of saving her son's life. So even back then, they knew how special it was to have property in Camus, right? <laughs> After two days in jail, Jed was visited by Mrs. Alfred Woodard and two of his sons, James and Calvin. He is still considered, he's still considered the shooting an accident. So pay attention to how Alfred would, Alfred would, too many woods, widow thought about the incident evolve over time her story changes a bit jed was given permission to go to the funeral of his son with the restrictions that his brother j e woodard stand guard over him words bishop who will later testify in jed's court case officiated the funeral it was held in the forestdale chapel the chapel still stands at 700 east and i on the 9th of May, one week after the killing, Jed was charged with first degree murder. On May 24th, 20 days after the shooting, the preliminary hearing began. From the newspaper, 
Dr. D. Andrew testified that he attended the boy after he had been shot. He described the wound in the boy's head and testified that it was from a 22 caliber rifle. Melvin Kimball testified that he was plant that he was planting potatoes in a lot nearby when he heard a shot and that on looking up, he saw the boy fall and the gun pointed at him. He said he heard two more shots. He did not know which shot took effect. Pearl V. Parkinson testified that she was in her room across the street from the Woodard home and that she heard the shots and saw the boy fall. She added that she heard the defendant threaten that he would shoot the boy. Hugo B. Anderson, the Justice of the Peace, conducted the preliminary hearing. The defense lawyer for Woodard, Woodard said that at least Jedediah Woodard is not guilty of any greater crime than voluntary manslaughter. The dramatic statement from a newspaper. For the first time in three and a half weeks, Jedediah Woodard walked from the custody of the officers of the law last night and had a bed that was not surrounded by iron bars. A few hours after the preliminary hearing, Judge J.L. Brown approved bonds in the sum of $3,000 for the release of the accused until the case could be heard in the district court. The bond was furnished by James Woodard, his brother, Fanny M. Woodard, sister-in-law, and James E. Mellon, a lifelong friend of the Woodard family. A little over a year after the slaying of Alfred Woodard, Jedediah's trial begins. The newspaper reports, with the defense still referring to the shooting as an accident, an effort by the state to show intent upon the part of Jedediah Woodard in the shooting of his son in the examination of star witness, Mrs. Pearl V. Parkinson, a neighbor of Woodard's. Mrs. Parkinson said she had heard him say, If you don't put those horses back in the barn, I'll shoot your guts out. <laughs> Whew, I had a nickel. Anyway, um, right, Pops? Anyway, testimony by... <laughs> we, don't, we don't have horses. Testimony by several other witnesses heard two or three shots before he finally sent a bullet into the brain of the youth. The defense made a strong effort to discredit Mrs. Parkinson, the star witness. Counsel for the defense told of having gone to the home of the witness and asked her to submit to a test which would show whether it, is, it were possible to hear what she claims to have heard from the point where she, where she was standing within her home. Mrs. Parkinson admitted having refused to submit to the test, declaring that the attorneys had insinuated her statement was willfully untrue and that made her angry. She saw him raise the gun pointing in the direction of the boy and then she heard a shot. Then she said Woodard and the youth sashayed around the yard, apparently quarreling for possibly five minutes. When Woodard raised the gun and she saw the sun fall, it was while they were sashaying around the yard that Mrs. Parkinson said she heard the threat made by Woodard. Then Alfred's wife, Minnie, took the stand. She told of how the trouble started. She said her husband and his father had been in a partnership engaged in hauling in the hauling of gravel and that they continued then until the father owed the son $392, which he told him he could either wait for or accept in horses. As you can see, this was not mentioned by Judd Dyer. When Alfred's wife was asked about her attitude towards her father-in-law, she said, I feel bitter towards him, but at the same time, I feel sorry for him. When Melvin Kimball was asked about what he saw, he said he heard shots, but his memory was hazy as the details. And he finally admitted that he was using his imagination where his memory failed him. Mrs. May Taylor, the Woodard's housekeeper, considered a star witness also, became a controversial figure in the trial. She had a lot to say and was mostly in defense of Jed. Here are some of the highlights. She saw Alfred double, double up his fist, draw back as though to strike his father, heard him curse his father several times, holding the rifle in his right hand saying, take them back, take them back. The trial was contentious as the district attorney insinuated improper relations between Woodard and the housekeeper. Mm. Mm. 
Of course, the defense objected and the statement was struck from the record. Um, however, that didn't mean that the jury didn't hear it. On March 31st, Alfred's wife testifies again. Notice how the as time goes on, her attitude towards her father-in-law shifted dramatically. Even the facts moved a bit in the retelling from $395 to $800. On April 1st, Jedediah was allowed to tell his story. This is a summary of what he said. Jed and Alfred were business, in business together. They had teams of horses and were hired to haul gravel. The price of feed became too high to make a profit, so Jed bought his son's share of the business. He claimed he still owed the boy around $300. Thereafter, Alfred had worked for him for $3 a day. On the day of the shooting, Alfred put a team of horses in the barn and came in the house for the noonday meal. At the table, Alfred informed his father that he had a $50 physician's bill to pay and that and that they had sold that they would sell the black team. Woodard said he told the boy he could not sell that team and was not to take uh, it out of the barn. I told him that I had just paid $400 note and had no money in the bank, that I would raise some money that day and pay him everything I owed him on payday, May 6th. The boy left the house dissatisfied and started for the barn. Woodard said, I saw a gun standing in the bathroom. I picked it up and started out. Mrs. Taylor, the housekeeper, tried to stop me. Don't take that gun, she said. I'm not going to hurt the boy. I'm just going to try to scare him, said Jedediah. Woodard's story of the tragedy differed little from those related by eyewitnesses, except that he was careful to say the rifle was not held by him in a menacing attitude when the fatal shot was fired and declared he had no intention of shooting. He said that he entered the backyard and saw Alfred leaving the barn, leading the black team. He fired one shot in the air. He showed how he said he had motioned at the boy and as he tried to get him to put the team back in the barn. When he was doing that, he said the rifle was discharged again. When after the boy had turned about and started to lead the team out of the front driveway, he said he saw Alfred fall. At that time, he declares he did not hear the rifle discharge. Hazily, he recollected telling Mrs. Taylor to call a doctor and the police. He also remembered bathing the face and head of the slain youth and of being arrested by his own brother. I didn't mean to do it, is what he recalled saying after the shooting. The next day, both sides attempted to establish Jed's reputation. Bernard Stewart, Woodland's defense lawyer's main defense was a, a wood, Woodard. <laughs> huh? Okay, a father would not intentionally shoot his own son. The district attorney bitterly assailed the character of the defendant, emphasizing bits of evidence which tend to show that he is a man of ungovernable temper and had repeatedly engaged in serious quarrels with his sons. When Woodard's current bishop, the man that was with him on the day of the shooting, as well as officiating at his son's funeral, testified against him by saying Woodard's reputation for quiet was bad, and prior to the tragedy, Woodard was not in good standing with the church. Still trying to establish Woodard's reputation, Woodard's defense lawyer is trying every angle that he can think of. Wilson McCarthy, the DA, reminds the jury of something about Mrs. May Taylor that was supposed to be struck from the record. <laughs> uh, we see Bishop Wood Woodruff for the fourth time, and he gets right to the point. He was immoral. <laughs> okay. Now it's your turn to be the jury. By raise of hands, was he not guilty and acquitted? Raise your hand if you think he was found not guilty. Okay, this jury is not going for that. <laughs> <laughs> he is guilty of voluntar involuntary manslaughter. Hands, hands. Okay. Guilty of second degree murder. Okay, that's split. <laughs> Guilty of first degree murder. Ooh, there's some mean people in there. All right. So rude. He was guilty of involuntary manslaughter. 
So you are the winners. We don't have any prizes. We just have, we have bragging rights. You have bragging rights. Good job. <laughs> yeah, that was it. I have a question. Yeah. Where, where was all this taking place? I never mentioned God or anything like that. Where was they living? Well, at the time, they had, they had moved to Salt Lake City. And this took place in Salt Lake City. Yep. What's that? The entire yeah the the shooting took place in Salt Lake City yeah, but the but as was noted the entire family including all of his siblings who children. were originally raised here in Camas had kind of oh, and children um, you know had moved into the city See, at this point. My theory is he should have never left Camas and moved to Salt Lake. <laughs> if he never found himself in the city, none of this would have happened. Yeah, causes too much stress. So. Clearly. What? Yeah, he did. I'll get there. Just be patient. My mother tells the story that after the shooting, he took off once California. Okay, he did. <laughs> That's... We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. Sit on your hands. <laughs> now, on April 4th, Judge P.C. Evans found Woodard guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Judge Dyer responded to the verdict. I fully expected that the jury would acquit me, but since it was found, it has found me guilty, I can only ask that any leniency that my past life might justify should be extended. The next day, the judge imposed the full penalty allowed by the verdict, which was one year in jail. It appears that the judge wanted a stiffer sentence in this statement. The court expressed doubt that the killing had been entirely accidental, leading to the conviction that it resulted from momentary rage and that the effort to intimidate had been ineffectual. Yeah, I'm shooting. Okay. Ineffectual. Woodard was pardoned and released from jail 11 months after his one-year sentence. In March of 1919, the same week his wife, Evelyn Vallette, filed for divorce. The newspaper said, desertion is alleged as the ground for the suit, the complaint being brief and alleging nothing against Woodard's character. I think she must have been a saintly woman myself. <laughs> okay. What happened to Jed after his release? We already know, so we'll skip this part. <laughs> <laughs> he, moved, he, he did move to California, and he married Mary Parkin on September 18, 1920. He, he, he did not waste any time at all. He died in California four years later, also not wasting any time. <laughs> so now, with that, any questions, comments, or concerns? Or who questions? Was his, who was his wife? Was she at Russell? Was his yes. His, what was his wife? Uh, yes. She was Russell, yeah. Yes, mother. Oh, no, I lost the name. Evelyn Villette Russell. Any other questions? Villette, V-I-L-A-T-E. Yes. Excuse me, did the Woodards go back to Camas <laughs> Some of the Woodards did, because I gave my car fixed to one of those Woodards. <laughs> <laughs> They're good people. They just had a, somebody that had a temper. <laughs> so there's a lot of Woodards today in Francis. Yes, there are. Good people. Yes, they are good people. I, yeah. they're, they're just... Sometimes we, we lose our temper and we shouldn't have guns with us when we do that. <laughs> That's just an idea. This guy? Yeah. Cool. Oh. Wow. Good job. He had we we've got the families well represented here. Um, like this next one, we I don't think there's anybody related to this guy because he had no children. Do we think that Mr. Woodard was already running from crime in Watertown, Massachusetts, and that's why he needed to get west? He kept going west in each crime. Do you know that? Do you know something I don't know? I know nothing. Well, typically we're all here because our ancestors came west. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. They, you know, Massachusetts got really crowded and they just started moving west. Lots of reasons. All right. So, the next guy. Some of you may know him. George Raphael Dunham was the seventh child in his father's family and with his second wife. He lived in Utah most of his life and had a variety of jobs and experiences. Many of those experiences. What? 
Many of those experiences involve being knocked on the head. As you'll see. <laughs> George Dunham's ancestors were prominent in the Puritan religion. He came to America in 1632, just 12 years after the Pilgrims. The family settled and stayed in, the New, Eng in New England for over 200 years. George's father, Levi Sinclair Dunham, was born in New York in 1847. In 1863, although he was only 16, Levi went to New Hampshire and enlisted in Company I of the 7th Regiment of the New Hampshire Volunteers. Levi came to Utah in 1881 and settled in the southern part of the state. He married two wives. George was born to Levi and Lucy Etta Childs of Moroni. George was born in 1896 in Kanab, Utah. This is a photo of some of his siblings and both of his wives. From both of his wives. From both. Oh, from both of his wives. Yeah. Get it right. Uh, <laughs> all right. With a sixth grade education, George enlisted in the Utah National Guard in 1916. He was a member of the E Troop in the 145th Art Field Artillery, 40th Division. It says on his records that he was promoted to cook, an occupation that will serve him well later in life. Shortly after joining the Utah National Guard, units from the Southwest, including Utah, were sent to the Mexican border at Nogales, Arizona, to protect the U.S. from Mexican issues. Just eight days after President Woodrow Wilson called the National Guard services, the Utah National Guard was ready and considered the most well-prepared of all the units. 276 men and 15 officers boarded a train and went to the border. History remembers the Utah soldiers as some of the best. The only action any of the men saw was going into Nogales and having unfortunate encounters with the locals. The guard unit stayed until the end of October, having served about four months. In 1917, he trained to fight in World War I and was trained and shipped on August 15, 1918, to France. He did, we don't know if he saw any action except to cook meals for the soldiers. The war was over a few months later. Before shipping out for the war, he worked in the coal mines near Bingham Canyon. On May 17th, he had his first encounter that we know of with the law. From the short article, George Dunham, an employee of the U.S. Mining Company, is in the city jail and is receiving medical attention as a result of an altercation with Patrolman Fee Culleton of the, Brigham, of the Bingham Police Force this morning. According to the patrolman, Dunham interfered with him when he was shooting a dog in pursuance of his duties. Dunham declared the officer struck him without provocation. In 1919, George married Sarah Ann Leota Fowles, known as Leota in Mount Pleasant, San Pete County. She was born and raised in that town. In 1924, George tried his hand at boxing he apparently practiced this sport at the popular Manhattan Club in Salt Lake City. It was known as the most stylish club west of the Mississippi. This club was in the basement of the New Grand Hotel located at 4th South and Main Street and sponsored boxing matches. Because of Utah's liquor laws, patrons would bring their booze in brown paper bags. I think they still do. <laughs> yes, but the underground boxing matches that still take place there. Uh, <laughs> that is a joke for legal reasons. <laughs> From the paper, in the second round of the scheduled six-round bout held here Saturday between Jess Stream and Fountain Green, former heavyweight champion of the Intermountain States and George Dunham of this place, former favorite for the Manhattan Club of Salt Lake City, the former landed an easy knockout punch to the mouth, having made Dunham groggy in the first round. No, this is another blow to the head. First war and then boxing. It's really... Hmm. Yeah. It seems that wherever George Dunham goes, trouble follows. In 1936, he worked as a water patrolman for Salt Lake City in Parley's Canyon Water Reserve, called Washington Park. According to his story, he encountered five picnickers as they were driving away from an outing and asked them to clean up their site. The four men and one woman refused and an argument turned into violence. He said Mrs. Parker, wife of Roy Parker, in the party grabbed him and Dunham was forced to strike her wrist with the end of his gun in order to break free and protect himself from her husband. 
Roy approaching from behind with a rock. The newspaper reported there were three rocks spotted on the ground with what the state contends is blood uh, from injuries suffered by the officer. They were admitted into evidence. Dunham asserts that he was finally overpowered. His gun taken from him, it was left on the ground. All five of the others claimed Dunham had created the disturbance with the result of both Mr. and Mrs. Parker were thrown in the creek. He testified he was drunk and acted hard boiled and overbearing. <laughs> Early, early 20th century words. <laughs> Those injured were Dunham, who was admitted to the Salt Lake General Hospital with lacerations and bruised on the head and face. Head. <laughs> head. The injured, also injured, was Roy Parker, who was treated for water immersion shock and lacerations, and Fred King, who suffered a deep head gash. Two of the men were released. Three involved in the attack, Mr. and Mrs. Parker and Fred King, were ordered to be held on a $750 bond. <laughs> Poor George. Poor in, George. Yes. In January of 1939, he had an encounter with a gun. From the newspaper, George Dunham, 42, was recovering today from a rifle wound in the right cheek. Dunham is laying down his 22 caliber rifle and deer rifle while he closed the garage door yesterday, was accidentally wounded when one of the guns struck against the hammer of the other f rifle discharging it. This will not be his last encounter with a gun. Trust me. This time the gun did it. <laughs> In 1944, George bought Camp Kilcare. Wait, who here remembers Camp Kilcare? All right. All right. Awesome. Okay. In 19, oh, yeah, just read that. Camp Kilcare was a resort built on the banks of the Provo River in Woodland by James Vashon Kirkpatrick. Patrick named it after a resort of the same name built in the Adirondacks in 1906 by New York Lieutenant Governor Timothy Woodruff. Lots of Woodruffs and Wood... Wood Woodard. Woodards. Okay, go ahead. Lots of W names. Yeah. Rooms were rented to boarders for $1 a day. Must be nice. The resort offered live music, dancing, sports competitions, such as boxing, and a tavern. George's wife, Leota, was famous for her delicious meals, which she served from 1944 to 1959 at the resort. When the Dunhams were running the resort, it was the place to go on the weekend. Some of you may have memories of this place, I already asked you, so yeah, you can tell us about it afterwards. November 8th, 1953. This man has a lot of bad luck. <laughs> George and two of his soon-to-be former friends from Salt Lake City went pheasant hunting. George was driving, coming back from the hunt at about nine at night. They ran head-on into a car about two miles east of Park City on Highway 40. One passenger, Mr. Garrett, suffered a fractured jaw, concussion, and a possible fractured skull. Mr. Sizemore had a severely fractured nose, contusions of the face, lacerations, and injured ankles. Mr. Dunham suffered a fractured left arm and lacerations of the chin and the right leg. Remember, this is before cars were required to have seat belts, let alone airbags. An interesting twist to the story. Five years later, Mr. Garrett and Sizemore sued George Dunham for damages caused by negligence for nearly $52,000. It was hinted by some that George had a drinking problem. <laughs> he did have a drinking problem. Go ahead. Just before the suit came to trial, Dunham declared bankruptcy. He was then charged with fraud for falsifying the deed to kill care, claiming the deed was uh, in his wife Leota's name. He did not win that suit. Living at the Kill Care Resort at the time of the incident was George Dunham, his wife Leota, Leota's 82-year-old mother, Mary Fowles Blaine, and Leota's brother, 43-year-old Verl Fowles, at the in-laws living with him. A little over two months after the fraud trial, on January 23rd, 1959, the Dunhams were watching television on Thursday night in one corner of the camp's bar. Apparently, they were watching a gangster movie. Of some sort. <laughs> From the newspaper, without warning, Mr. Dunham took out a 32 caliber revolver and fired one shot in the ceiling. He then turned the gun on his mother-in-law, shooting her above the left ear, and then fired at his wife, 
hitting her in the shoulder. He aimed at Mr. Fowles, the brother-in-law, picked up a chair, and as Mr. Dunham fired, he hurled the chair. The chair struck Mr. Dunham and temporarily subdued, temporarily subdued him. The bullet struck Mr. Fowles in the left shoulder. Mr. Fowles managed to get the revolver and also gathered up two other guns kept in the house. Here are a few of the headlines from around the state. I love that word, sir. <laughs> Good, good one. Good times. <laughs> Whew. All three victims were able to walk to the family station wagon and drive to Camas, where they were no, where they notified Elmo Atkinson, the deputy sheriff. Mr. Dunham was left behind. Wonder why. Sheriff Atkinson sent George Lewis to the campground in case a fire started. We don't know why he said in case a fire started, but we're going with it. <laughs> it's just assume that somebody shoots somebody and they're going to start a fire. Yeah. And went with the wounded Nielsen Memorial Hospital to keep her. When Deputy Atkinson went back to the tourist camp, he and Mr. Lewis apprehended Mr. Dunham with no trouble. They found him sleeping peacefully in his bed. <laughs> a complaint charging Mr. Dunham with false, with, with, with false assault with a deadly weapon and intent to murder was signed before the Justice of the Peace, Edith Crittenton and Francis. Justice Crittenton said the criminal complaint would be used only if Mr. Dunham was found to be capable of standing trial. He was taken immediately to the Utah State Mental Hospital in Provo. George Dunham was held in the Utah State Hospital on a temporary commitment order pending a psychiatric examination. A few days after the shooting, the three victims were reported in satisfactory condition. They were released from the hospital within a From the newspaper, the bullet which struck Mrs. Dunham on the right chest passed on through her body. The bullet which struck the elderly Mrs. Blaine in the head also passed through. Mr. Fowles was struck in the right arm, however, and the bullet lodged in his shoulder. Shortly after the incident, Deputy Sheriff Wilbur Powell said this. Dunham had apparently been drinking heavily prior to the shooting. Sheriff George Fisher reported this to the newspaper. Dunham was involved in a serious accident from which only a very strong man should have recovered. Physicians are investigating the possibility that brain injury might have resulted. You think? Mm. Temporary stay at the Utah hospital turned into nearly two years, and it was there that he died on January 21st, 1961. He was only 64 years old. His wife, Leota, went on to live another 21 years when she died in, in February 13th, 1982. They were both buried in the Francis Cemetery. Any questions or comments about Mr. Dunham? Do you understand why he did it? I think he might have been knocked on the head a few times. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think he had mental problems and also. But, but did, did he, he say no, why he did it? It didn't say in the paper. However, I tried to put some clues in there that I think, I mean, he was being uh, sued for fraud. And uh, I think he had a lot on his mind. He was losing Camp Kill Care. He was in a mess. And, uh, that, and he was drinking. So drinking and guns. <laughs> and Not brain a, injuries. And brain injuries. They would go to rodeos? Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, he was, he was quite a character, for sure. Yeah. So we just kind of assume that it's a combination of multiple things that ultimately just resulted in a, a moment of, of madness. Yes, that can happen. My furnace is completely shot today mm -hmm. as I got up out of bed and froze to death. So... I didn't kill anybody, but I felt like <laughs> I was, I'm lucky I was out of the house. <laughs> it is gone. Where was it? Uh, it was up. Uh, it was soon. It's it's past past Right. And so it's the place that Ricky Martinez fought. You know where that is? Mm -hmm. It's probably about a mile. Would you say a mile? 
There's a road up there called Kill Terror Loop. It burned down from the top of the thing about a mile. So it burned down, and Rick, Ricky Martin, Dean Martin's son, bought it in 1960 and turned it into a uh, recording studio. Isn't there a picture up there um, on the wall of the part of Camp Kildare, which is now the, what was the 95 Camp Rail? No. Yes, that's well. No, I'm not extend down. It's not my picture. <laughs> um, yeah, Paul's over there waving the calendar around. We have calendars for half price uh, for 2022 patterns. Oh, Camp Kilker. Yeah, there's a piece on Camp Kilker. Sorry. I never went in the place. Kevin's no. I never went in the place. I wasn't allowed to by my parents. Right. <laughs> because it had a pretty bad reputation. Right. <laughs> right, Jack? What's that? I didn't do all of it. 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 That's where all the cool stuff was, guys. Wow. Hey, I just said that I, I never got to go in there, but uh, my parents, my father, because he had the drugstore, right. he thought he should uh, um, not go in there, but he ought to give them some business. So he took the whole family out there and we sat in the car. He went in and ordered hamburgers and brought them out to us to eat in the car. <laughs> awesome. I remember that they were wonderful. And I also remember the smell of the place. That's a memory in my mind. And, and can you describe the smell? The smell was grease and smoke. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that tracks. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of people that have told about uh, memories. I won't say fond memories. Sweet Helen Jones, if you know her, she lives over by the post office. She was sent there when she was 14, and she met her hus future husband there. So <laughs> things happen. Got to be careful. <laughs> oh, On the other side, the flip side, when I was just a little, my mom was Leota's visiting teacher. We would go up there, so I'd been in there. <laughs> and she would always give me a Snickers bar when awesome. my mom visited her. Awesome. She was a sweet lady. Yeah. And I guess she was a good cook, and she lived longer than yeah. George. Yeah. I also had memories of when Leona, after Camp Kilgare was gone, or she was sick, and she... I think there were some people who helped her get a home in a family. I don't know where that home is. And I, I visited there. Cool. And, uh, she was dying of a serious illness. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. It was a very popular place if they had a dance ball there. I know a lot of guys from Camion over the hill. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> And there was sort of a rumor. I'm just I'm just repeating a rumor that George was uh, willing to give underage boys and girls liquor, but I'm not sure. Just a rumor. <laughs> totally a rumor. <laughs> I think some people verified the rumor. <laughs> Yeah, and I wasn't allowed to go in, but I went anyway, right? <laughs> uh, you had your hand up? My father was one of those who came over to Hill. Ah, awesome. Uh, I have no idea if this is true or not, but I grew up with another, uh, some other kids that uh, ended up going to East High. It's all I know, but uh, their dad went to East High also, and he was tall and lanky and freckled and redheaded. And uh, he came up with the rest of the football team to the Clyde's place to throw hay in the summer before football. 
and they would let them go into Camp Kilcare. He always told us that he would go in and have a coat, but <laughs> well, I'm just saying. The, story, the story goes that Laurie was standing at the bar and somebody came up and tapped him on the shoulder. Laurie turned around and he banged him. What? The fight ensued. And it went outside and he was holding his own against this guy. And keep in mind, this is a high school kid. And pretty soon it got broken up and it might have been just another one broken up. But uh, after everybody dusted off, Sorry asked the man who hit him, he said, why'd you hit me? And the man replied, well, ain't you an Atkinson? <laughs> well, I can see so that. When, when that happens, <laughs> on the fly, just hip up my <laughs> That was That was uh, Sheriff Elmo Atkinson. A lot of you remember him. Right? Very concerned about fires. <laughs> yeah, not around here is twin. And the deputy, do you all remember what he was called? Yes. <laughs> Who was George Lewis? What was George Lewis called? Say it again. Chocolate. Chocolate? You know, I've never lived in a town where so many people have nicknames. I mean, with the older generation, everybody had it. I'm glad I didn't live here. Yes, Germ, as they used to call him. <laughs> George. What? Uh, kind of. It, the, the, the presentation, the whole thing is being recorded, Pops. The whole thing's being recorded. Yeah. The comments. The comments. All the comments by people being recorded. I mean. You'd have to ask Joe. You're doing. It should be. Yeah. Should be. Yeah. We can. We can hear you on our mics. <laughs> Any other great memories? Yes. Not a memory, but a question. How long did she cook for the camp and how I believe they were there from forty-four to fifty-nine. So she loves it. Yeah. She what? She, she left. She yeah. She left kill care, but she stayed in the valley until eighty two. Yeah. On first east, just yeah. south of where we're at. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. I, I got yeah, okay. Good to know. So she moved out there after the whole incident. <laughs> She put it up in the paper to say that Kilcare was still open in 1961. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Well, she must have been running it by herself or somebody because they didn't have any kids. So I don't know who was helping them. So maybe that our notes are maybe. inaccurate. We might, she might have been cooking for them for much longer after that. Could be. Anything else? I knew this one would probably get most of the attention. He wants to make a movie out of it. <laughs> yes. Make a great screenplay. As a fellow outsider, how do you pick these three families? Well, we're interested in history, and Kate over there doesn't sleep at night. And so she goes through newspapers, and I go through newspapers, uh, you know, archived newspapers. I'm on newspapers.com, and we hear people say something about somebody. So we were researching the kill care. Um, it's in our calendar. One of the one of the months is on kill care. And if you pull that up, you find out these things. And then I just searched and searched and searched and found all sorts of things about him. And that's how we find out. There are originally a few others that you were looking at doing, right? Like three oh, we, or four others. We have about 12 or 15 more people. Okay, but, more than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so we're thinking of having part two and part three, but it looks like you, people might be interested in that. Yeah, I would love to just say that. But, so those of you that don't follow us on Instagram, you know the Instagram system? Okay, right, so regular. Yeah. Once a week. Huh? Once a week. Yeah. It was once a week, wasn't it? So, uh, No, no, most of the people are really good so people. This particular, can I turn up? Can I stop you? Go ahead. <laughs> but I don't want you to 
to wrap up to stop it. We, to be honest, that's why we're here, because as George said, we want these comments, we want to try and record them. They are people's history, I think. I'm sure you were here when I started talking, and I said that you know, after history is disappearing second by second as we live here, because it's in people's minds. They're either forgetting or they're passing. And that is lost forever. Whether it's true, whether it's an interpretation, whether it's a story of time, in fact, fiction, it's valuable because it's another little piece in the puzzle. So that's why we wanted you to come, and we're really grateful. But the most important thing is that the stories here, as I said earlier, they were chosen without any attempt to pick individual people. They're stories which are think are colourful. And they also, they actually have some meaning in our current environment. There is a war going on. There's been a war going on for 25, 30 years, certainly since the war on terror began. You can definitely remember that. My grandfather fought in both world wars. My father fought in the Second World War. He was on D-Day 7, D-Day plus 7. Speech on D-Day plus 7. And I lived with those histories. He passed them on to me, his interpretation. They were nothing like the sort of things you see in Hollywood or in the, in the written histories. They are obviously interpretations. I'm personally more interested in actual people's stories going from their voices and their minds. We can't do that with these three people. All we can do is the newspaper records and maybe some, some discussion and comment and rumor and etc. But it, all it does is it just adds to a perspective. So if only we could go back and actually interview these people, talk to them, find out what they would think. They might shoot you. <laughs> you might. Yeah. You might. Yeah. But the reality is... If they're not drinking their wine. Unless we try <laughs> to understand <coughs> our forebears' circumstances and therefore their history, their, what happened to them, let's even try and understand what they would be experiencing. You know, we're, we're going to miss out on the lessons that that teaches us today, which I personally feel are very relevant. A lot of the things that came up today, yeah. We, we will probably be contacting anybody that made comments, like you you folks back there that yeah. seem to know things. Um, we actually interviewed the, uh, what would we call them, the more experienced people that have lived here a long time <laughs> to capture those stories. So yeah, we're still we, that. we uh, post them on our website. And yeah, so quite a few people. Yeah, so have this interview is probably the most, the most deepest, and that is there are nine of each posts on the website, which is to pick out individual bits of Ken's story. But we would probably have preferred to interview Ken five years or 10 years ago. And in fact, we were very fortunate. If you think about the last six months, particularly in Ken's life, I think we caught him just in time. So yeah. we realized- About a month before he passed away. We're running out of time in terms of preserving this history. So we want to hear as much from everybody, all the perspectives, and try to help preserve it, to keep that jigsaw piece that we're trying to build, building, making sure that it has the fullest amount of possible we can. It is impossible for us, but we're doing our very best. But thank you very much for coming today.